Hey everyone, Victor is here, and in this video I want to talk about an industrially important method of carboxylic acid synthesis, which is called a co-half carbonylation reaction. Typically, we are going to see a reaction between an alcohol and the carbon monoxide in the presence of the acid, something like sulfuric acid, and as a result we are going to get a carboxylic acid. The reaction is typically done at somewhat mild conditions. When it comes to the temperature, usually we are looking at about 50 50 degrees. However, when it comes to the pressure of our carbon monoxide, it's not as mild, because normally we are going to see something like 50 atmospheres, which is a fairly high pressure, so it's not something that you would normally see done in the lab. Now, when it comes to the mechanism of this reaction, we are going to start by taking our alcohol and protonating it with our sulfuric acid, so we are going to make the following intermediate over here, and now we have H2O on our molecule which is an excellent living group. So we are going to have this living group popping off, we are going to have the living group dissociation, as a result of this living group dissociation we are going to end up with a carbocation intermediate. So it is important for this reaction to be able to form a carbocation intermediate. So primary uh, substrates are usually out of question, although some reactions are known with those, secondary substrates can be a little bit problematic as well, and if if we have a primary or secondary substrates, chances are we are going to be seeing carbocation uh, rearrangements. Now, next, we are going to bring our carbon monoxide, and here I am showing the Lewis structure uh, that shows that carbon actually bears a partial negative charge, which means that carbon is a nucleophile in this case. So what we can see here is that carbon can attack our carbocation like so, making a new carbon-carbon bond, giving us an acylium carbocation as our intermediate here. And of course here I am showing the most uh, prevalent resonance contributor, however you can show a resonance contributor with a plus on the carbon as well. Now, next thing that we are going to see here is the attack by water, which is typically present in this uh, reaction. So water is going to be playing a role of a nucleophile. It is going to come in, attack our carbon like so, making a new carbon-oxygen bond looking like this. Now, from this point, the only thing that is left for us is to bring another equivalent of water, or essentially anything with an electron pair, and do a simple proton transfer, pulling that proton off and giving us our final product, which is going to be a carboxylic acid. Now, a really cool part about this reaction is that it really doesn't matter how you make your carbocation. For instance, let's look at this reaction over here. I'm starting with an alkene, cyclohexene, and in this case I'm reacting it with sulfuric acid, so step number one, I am actually going to show the structure of my sulfuric acid, and I will show the nucleophilic attack from the double bond on our proton, or you can think about it as an electrophilic attack from the sulfuric acid onto our alkene, giving us the following carbocation as our intermediate. Now, from this point, we are going to bring our carbon monoxide, that guy is going to do our nucleophilic attack on the carbocation, making a new carbon-carbon bond, and I'm going to skip a few mechanistic steps here and give you the final product right away. From this point, as soon as we form our carbocation, the mechanism here is going to be exactly what I had a moment ago, so there are going to be no difference from this point. Now, alternatively, we could also use alkyl halides as sources of the carbocation. So if I have this alkyl halide over here, and I somehow rip that halogen off by using strong Lewis acids like iron chloride or aluminum chloride, or a well-known uh, method for ripping halides off your molecule in, in the form of the silver, silver plus is going to bind with the uh, alkyl halides and rip that halogen off, forming a very unsoluble silver chloride, and in this case, if I go through the step of this reaction and form the carbocation, I'm going to end up with the corresponding carboxylic acid over here. Mechanistically speaking, if let's say you wanted to draw the mechanism of this reaction, you would just show the leaving group dissociation like so, then form the corresponding carbocation, and then from that point it's exactly the same mechanism over and over again, the one that I have already showed you a moment ago. Now, as I've mentioned, the biggest problem and the downfall of this reaction, why this reaction doesn't find much 
much uh, use in the lab is we need to use a high pressure of our carbon monoxide. And as you know, carbon monoxide is a very toxic substance, so we definitely don't want to work with that in the lab, and especially not at very high pressures, because if any accident should happen, well, that will be deadly. So the alternative that exists here is that instead of the carbon monoxide, we can actually use formic acid. The cool part about the formic acid, though, is that if you bring formic acid in contact with a strong mineral acid, like let's say sulfuric acid, formic acid tends to decompose into carbon monoxide and water, which means that we can be creating carbon monoxide in situ right there during our reaction. So in this case, the conditions are going to be much milder, the reaction often can proceed even at room temperatures, we don't have to use harsh uh, high pressure of carbon monoxide, and we still can get our carboxylic acid. Now, the biggest problem here is, of course, the formation of the carbocation, and as we know, when it comes to carbocations, we have all possible problems associated with that, mainly rearrangements. In this case, in this video, I didn't show any examples with rearrangements, but you can imagine that as soon as we have a carbocation, especially if we attempt to make a carbocation on primary or secondary position, that is a recipe for the disaster. Even tertiary carbocations could potentially rearrange, so generally speaking, this reaction doesn't give very good yields and only suitable for industrial use because of those uh, limitations. In the lab, where we do care about yield and where we do care about having as few side products as possible, carbocation rearrangements are typically not a welcome guest. But as I said, in industry, when we are doing it on a huge scale, that is not that big of a deal. So, what do you think about this reaction? Have you ever seen that before? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, thank you for watching. If you learned something new today, boop that like button and subscribe for more. Check out this video next and I will see you next time.